my dear friends, it's time to embrace your fear. Come and join me over at The Chilling App, where I'm also a regular storyteller, just like here on YouTube. Now, the app is, of course, available anywhere where you get your apps, and it's absolutely free. There are hundreds of stories, many by yours truly, including this one here. Now, it's got even better since you last visited, because we now can evolve the stories into short films. And yet, what else? Well, in addition to audio, there is, of course, video. And if you haven't been there for a while, you're going to be amazed at how many films are available to you. So, don't forget, download the Chilling app now. There's a free version with adverts as well as a subscription model. So don't forget to embrace your fear. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. I Woke Up in a Lighthouse by Bo Whiskey There's a cove that leads to a vast, dark ocean. It is perpetually covered in fog that ebbs and flows over itself like a slow-beating heart. Sometimes it lightens up enough to see through the haze and make out the shape of the rocky outcroppings, cliffs and beach. On a good day, when the tide is low, a man-made stone pathway can be easily spotted leading from the shore to a strange lighthouse. When the tide is higher, it's more difficult to see the path, but it can still be followed if you don't mind getting your feet wet. Unlike most lighthouses you've seen in photos, this one has roots in the water itself. And I mean that literally. With that low tide, you can also see enormous roots branching off of the lighthouse itself, like those tropical trees that grow in the water. It's as if the structure is partly organic, along with the steel and stone that were used to create it. The light atop the tower also doesn't function as you would expect. It isn't strong and doesn't cut through the fog. It doesn't seem to matter, though, as I've yet to see or hear any kind of vessel in the area. There are a few other things about it that don't make sense, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, on the shore, directly across from the beacon, there's a decently sized home. I assume it functioned as a keeper's house at one point, built for whoever was in charge of the lighthouse and their family. But now I'm occupying it. It's not huge, but it seems large enough for a married couple and a kid or two. There's nothing fancy or special about it, except for one single thing that I can't figure out. It's surrounded by a weathered iron cage. The lower section, perpendicular to the ground, where you'd expect a normal iron fence to be on some houses, the bars are thick, leaving only a couple of inches between them. And they're tall, a bit taller than the house itself. The bars surround the entire house, leaving only maybe five feet from any exterior wall. But then the bars curve and meet a latticework of thinner bars that crisscross over the roof itself. The entire house is in an iron cage. At first I couldn't understand why anyone would cage a house, but... I think after the past month, I can assume it's to protect whoever's inside. I remember the old superstitions about iron warding off ghosts and creatures, but well, I never considered it to be a real thing. After what I have witnessed so far, though, I believe it is. I believe I'm protected here, which is why I haven't left yet. Why I haven't tried to find a way home, wherever that is. Beyond the cove, the lighthouse and the house itself... I don't know where I am. Worse yet, I don't know how I got here. I'm struggling to remember almost anything leading up to when I woke up in the lighthouse 27 days ago. Many things I just know, like my name, Aurora, and how to write, and speak, walk, simple math, reasoning, and so on. Uh, it's the details leading up to my arrival that are fuzzy. I can vaguely recall memories from when I was younger. My mother, some school days, and graduating high school. Now they're all hazy like the atmosphere in the cove. They feel so far away, detached from me, even though I know they're mine. There's a gap, though. There's a stretch of recent time that I can't remember anything. I don't know exactly how far this stretch is. It's difficult to pinpoint a memory and be able to tell it's the most recent. That doesn't even really matter right now. What matters is that I simply don't know how I got here or why I'm here, or where here is, or anything of the sort. 
All I know for certain at this moment is that this can't be the real world that I came from. I don't know if I'm dead and it's hell, or if I'm on some alien planet or what, but, well, I need to get out of here. There's a small journal in the lighthouse. Now, I know it's mine. I woke up with it in my coat pocket. But I left it there when I escaped to the house. I hope it holds some clues as to what's going on. I just have to work up the courage to try and retrieve it. That's the most difficult thing right now. Terrified, I'm not sure I could survive going outside again. Right, let me go back so you might understand. 27 days ago, I woke up on my stomach on a cold metal floor. I was disoriented and everything in my body screamed with pain. It was a deep, bone-crushing, limbs-on-fire pain. My head was pounding so hard that it hurt to even open my eyes. Eventually, after lying there for what felt like an hour or more, I was able to push through the pain and use my arms to lift my torso up and look around. It took a long time to be able to move my head much, or move enough to put myself in a seated position. My vision was blurry, and I could barely make out anything around me except for unfamiliar shapes. I managed to reach out and feel a wall that I then inched my way towards put my back against it and close my eyes, trying to focus on my breathing in order to get through the horrible feeling in my entire body. After a few minutes, with my eyes still closed, I used my other senses to try and get an idea of my surroundings. I gingerly moved my hands over the floor, feeling that it turned from a metal grate to concrete a few inches from the wall. It felt sturdy where I was, which was a relief. Next, I took in a deep breath and smelled and tasted salty air. I listened hard, trying to cut through the sound of my wildly beating heart and blood rushing through my ears. It took longer than I'd like to admit for me to realize that what I was hearing wasn't my internal functions after all. It was waves crashing somewhere near me. Ocean. It had to be an ocean. I hovered one hand over my eyes as I opened them, trying to let them take their time to focus. After a moment, I blinked and moved my hand away. Everything around me was still altered, with soft and static -y edges, but I could actually make out distinct shapes now. Before me, in the center of the room, was a massive light. It wasn't a light or moving, but I immediately recognized it as the revolving light for a lighthouse. I was in a damn lighthouse, and it felt like I'd been dropped onto the floor there from a painful height. I continued to look around the sparse room, double-checking that the roof appeared to be completely intact. For the next few hours, I worked on being able to stand and then walk, or rather shuffle, around. I racked my brain to try and remember how I'd gotten there. That was where I began realizing all the things I couldn't remember. And it was difficult to focus on my own mind's lack of details, though. It only made my headache worse. Instead, I began inspecting my surroundings. Through the great glass walls of the room, I couldn't see much. I could make out the general shape of the rocks nearest me, but the fog was too thick to see very far. Once I felt I could manage it, I located the stairs and began my descent. It was a tremendously slow process, as I had to take it one stair at a time, and my legs still felt as if they could buckle at any second and send me crashing down the entire way. The closer I got to the bottom, though, I began to hear a noise that's a bit difficult to describe. At first it sounded like, oh, only like someone wailing, but it evolved to have a strange sort of melody to it. Just hearing it made my heart feel like breaking, and I wasn't sure why. This mix of a mournful lament and keening grew louder, and I recognized it as being something I'd never heard a human make before. It was unearthly. That's the best way I can describe it. It wasn't that it was made of multiple voices. No, it was a single voice. But it wasn't human. At least I'd never heard a human make that sound before. The way it infected my very being only added to the ethereal idea I was forming about its source. There were no windows along the walls, though, so I couldn't try to determine what or who it was. It still wasn't all the way to the bottom of the stairs, but it froze me in place. Just when I thought I wouldn't be able to take it anymore, and I'd break down into my own tears, it tapered off. The voice began to drift in the air, becoming more distant and fading into nothing. And then, it was completely gone. 
I took a few breaths to steady myself and continued making my way to the bottom. At the bottom of the lighthouse, there was a simple room. It wasn't much bigger than a walk-in closet and didn't contain anything but a small cot with a damp blanket. The walls here were stone, as if the room had been there longer than the rest of the lighthouse. There was a metal door set into one wall, opposite the stairs. At the base of the door was a large piece of rectangular metal. I looked closely at the door and determined the thick piece of metal had once been used to bar the door. At some point, one of the hooks that must have held it in place against the door had been broken, and now it wouldn't be of any help. My trip from the top to the bottom of the structure had left me exhausted, and I laid down on the cot. Before long, I'd fallen asleep. I spent the next two days there, building my strength back up and working my stiff and sore body before I made my way outside. I spent my time wandering up and down the stairs, partly for exercise and partly to try and get a sense of where I might be. I looked for anything that might give me a clue as to why I was here or who might have been here before, but there was simply nothing. I went through my own pockets and discovered the journal I mentioned before, along with a lighter, a ring that fit my own finger, and a key on a small leather cord. The cord was just long enough to slip over my hand, and let the key dangle around my wrist, and so I let it stay there. I tried every finger, and found that the ring best fits on my left ring finger. I couldn't remember if someone had given it to me or not. I couldn't remember if it meant I was married, or engaged, or something else. It was a simple silver band with small black gemstones inlaid around it. I left the lighter in my pocket and opened the journal. I somehow knew it was my own handwriting, and that the journal was mine. Hoping to glean some information from it, I began flipping through the pages, scanning them quickly to try and look for anything that popped out to help me understand what had happened. Before I made it very far into the journal, the lament began again. It didn't fade into existence or start slowly. No, it was sudden and abrupt. I flinched at the sound of it and dropped the journal onto the floor. Without thinking better of it, I looked all around me before I remembered that there were no windows. The only options I had here were to go all the way up the stairs and hope I could see through the fog well enough to find whoever was out there, or go outside through the metal door. The latter idea made my heart start to race, and I felt anxiety bubble up inside of me, but I wasn't sure why. It didn't take long for me to decide to go through the door, though. As nervous as I was to venture outside, I knew it was going to have to happen eventually. Suddenly, I couldn't quite remember why I'd put it off for so long. I was still in a bit of pain, yes, but I hadn't even considered going outside. Until that moment, I simply hadn't wanted to. The handle of the door was cold in my hand, and I braced myself. The door opened with a soft scraping against the floor. It wasn't as heavy as I'd expected it to be, though. There was no rush of air against my face or shocking sight. It was all just misty and dull. Before me was a small concrete platform leading to the stone pathway that connected the lighthouse to land. I stepped out and stood there, looking around. I could see trees in the distance, cliffs towering around the cove, and water lapping gently over the pathway itself. I followed the heartbreaking and melancholy crying with my eyes and ears and saw a woman on the shore. She was crouched down in the water near some rocks with her hands moving around in the water. There was a veil over her face, but I could tell that she was thin, frighteningly thin, and her clothes looked worn and tattered. Without thinking much of it, I began walking up the path to land, taking care not to slip on the wet stone. The whole time, she didn't look up from what she was doing and didn't seem to notice my presence. The moment my foot came into contact with the rocky shore, though, her head jerked up and cocked to the side. It was an unnatural jerking motion, as if the bones in her neck should have cracked or dislodged themselves. She didn't look at me yet, and her lament never wavered. This unnerved me, but I continued on, making my way toward her. Are you okay? I called out, my voice cracking. It was then that I realized not only was I crying, but I also hadn't used my voice in at least a couple of days. It felt strange to have words emit from my throat and mouth, but I couldn't focus on that at the moment. She still didn't look at me. Instead, she tilted her head back down in another swift and unnatural motion, 
and continued moving her hands in the water. I approached her as calmly as I could, trying to talk to her a few more times to no avail. When I was close enough, I realized that she was rubbing her hands along the rocks under the water. Fabric billowed around her fingers in strips. I reached out to touch her shoulder, but before I made contact, she froze. Her wailing song stopped and her body twitched. In an instant, she was standing, facing me, her back completely straight and her veil being pushed gently by the breeze. She was so close that her veil, old and rotting against her face, would almost touch my nose. If the wind picked up at all, it would brush against my own skin. I gave a small squeak, made to step back, but I was frozen in place. Standing there face to face with her, I began wishing I hadn't ventured outside at all. In that same bone-cracking way her head had moved, she moved one of her arms. She paused for a moment, her hand dangling above the crown of her head. Then she stretched and wiggled her fingers, as if testing them. I saw that the cloth I'd noticed before was actually bandages wrapped around each of her fingers and hand, reaching up to her wrist. The bandages were torn, and I could make out bits of flesh there too, detached from bone, just hanging there, entwined with the fabric that was torn and ragged. Her joints popped and clicked like breaking tree branches. She took the top of her veil in one hand and pulled it up away from her face. That horrid face. Oh, the skin on and around her lips was cracked and torn, as if there was no moisture in her body at all. Streaks of blood ran down her face in place of tears. She looked like she was barely skin stretched over a skeletal frame. Her eyes were milky white in sunken sockets, with no pupils or colour to be seen at all. My trance was broken quickly, though, as a noise resounded from the trees behind her. She seemed surprised as well, and we both looked in that direction that it had come from. As I looked over her shoulder, I saw something even more shocking than her visage. Crashing through the trees was a creature that made my veins feel icy. It instilled in me a sense of that primal fear you hear about when people meet predators in the wild. Before I could even completely see it, I knew I was afraid. Not even just afraid. I was petrified and I needed to flee. The lamenting woman stepped back into the water and continued her song as if nothing was happening. I, however, began to book it the second that thing came fully into view. I didn't know where to go and had no plan. I just ran up the small incline, away from the lighthouse and the water. I heard it pursue me. It was fast, but its gait sounded awkward. I didn't realize that until I thought about it later, though. A high-pitched shriek came from behind me as I ran, my blood pumping, my still-healing body aching. It was a piercing sound that made me cover my ears and tumble as I made my way toward the trees. I could just barely make out something there that wasn't part of the forest. As it came into view, I was able to see the iron cage. I felt both of my feet slip out from under me. I fell face first onto the hard ground. I didn't have time to try and brace myself for the landing, and ended up landing roughly on my hands, tearing. One caught a jagged rock that cut open my palm. When it hurt like hell at the time, but now I'm just glad I didn't land on my face. I looked back to see what had made me fall, and that's when I got a good look at it. I rolled onto my back and saw the rope around my ankles. It hadn't reached me yet, but had managed to tangle my feet up in some sort of lasso. I sat up and reached down, desperately trying to untangle myself before it caught up completely. Between glances at the rope, I saw the creature approaching. It was almost humanoid, except it was taller than a normal human, at least nine feet tall, and it had eight limbs, four arms and four legs. Where a body should stay straight to the tailbone, it was bent, almost reminding me of a centaur, except that the legs were human, set just far enough apart to make running without tripping over itself possible. At the elbow joint, its arms split in two on each side, giving it double the forearms and hands. On those hands were still fingers, but they were short, only about half the length you would expect. The claws that extended in place of nails were hard, sharp, and jagged. I know how sharp they were, because as soon as I was free of the rope, it had closed the distance enough to lunge from me, 
wrapped two of those hands around my car. Now I was cut in deep, and I was left with ragged slashes in my pants and my skin as I wrenched myself out of its grip. It appeared to be naked, with the deep blue skin covered in scars that almost glowed. The scars were everywhere, across the torso, the arms, the legs, the face. His face was possibly the most terrifying part to me. It was childlike, cherubic even. A dark wavy hair that fell to its shoulders, tangled with small sticks and leaves and pine needles. But its face was that of a small child. The cheeks were doughy and the eyes glimmered. And it never stopped smiling at me. Although the face could have been something found in any painting of small angels, that smile was something altogether blood-curdling. It was wide and frightening, with small teeth that looked sharper than its claws. As I crawled backward on my elbows and scrambled to get to my feet, I heard it giggle. It wasn't a normal kid giggle either. It was almost a cross between a gurgle and a laugh. And with a final burst of all the energy I could muster, I sprinted toward the cage and away from the thing pursuing me. I slammed my hands into the iron fence and quickly began following the perimeter for a way in. At the back of the structure, I found a locked gate. Without fully processing what I was doing, I grabbed the key from my wrist and shoved it into the keyhole. It fit. I don't know why I had this key, but it fit, and I pushed the gate open and shut as quickly as I could. As the lock clicked into place, I saw and felt the extra-limbed thing slam into it. It screeched in pain and began crying as a toddler might when pitching a fit. Its voice became discordant as it cried. I stepped away from the gate slowly until my back reached the wall of the house. I only spared a glance at the door behind me as I felt for the doorknob. The creature had resorted to grabbing whatever it could and throwing it at the fence. A few pebbles managed to find their way through the bars and one even hit me in the leg, but it seemed the thing itself couldn't come in. I opened the door, thankful to find it unlocked. I finally turned around to make my way into the house. I stood there for a while after I shut the door, just staring at it, dissociating from the inability to comprehend what had just happened. After a while, I was able to come back to the reality I was in. The creature was still outside screaming and crying like a spoiled child, but the lamenting woman had stopped at some point. Doing my best to ignore it, I made my way around the house and found some first aid items to clean and bandage my leg. It was in bad shape and I only hoped it wouldn't become infected. After what I assume were several hours, the childlike forest monster wandered off. I found a bed in one of the rooms and passed out. This is where I've been ever since. Over the next few days, just as I had in the lighthouse, I took my time looking through everything here in the caged house. I found this laptop that seems to connect to some sort of Wi-Fi every few days, some books in various languages that I can't understand, and other basic necessities. It appears that this house is still set up for someone to live here, so I'm taking advantage of it. There's no TV, and the water is either frigid or scalding, but I've been making it work as well as I can. It's difficult to see through the iron bars clearly, especially when the fog is thick or it snows ash. Sometimes I can make out the lighthouse easily. The lamenting woman appears every few days, and other things have made appearances. I'm terrified of getting caught by anything out there, but I'm beginning to think I have no choice. I need to know where I am and what this place is. At the very least, I think I'm going to have to retrieve that journal. I just hope it has some answers. Well, if I die trying, at least I tried, right? Maybe then I could actually sleep. I know my house is haunted. By Bo Whiskey. I know there are things in my house. Other things. Other beings. Well, I'm used to this, actually. It's just part of who I am and what my home is. And has been for as long as I can remember. They always come and go. Usually without much damage. Even the stubborn other things eventually can be dispelled. But the ones that have come to me recently are unlike anything I've dealt with before. And I fear they may be the end of me. I'm trying to recall when exactly it began. 
My days have become blurry, but I'll do my best. I believe the first instance where I noticed signs that these things, these new things had arrived, well, I remember there being small signs. Things moved around, items disturbed or misplaced, an uneasy feeling of not being alone, temperature changes, faucets running, floorboards creaking. The uh, typical signs of a haunting, you know? Well, I've become accustomed to them, so they don't frighten me, but they do make me alert. Not everything that passes through my home has always been very friendly. I started becoming alarmed when I noticed wallpaper peeling off of the walls in one of the upstairs bedrooms. I know that over time this can happen, but it was coming off in large strips and I could hear it being ripped away from the wall. The sharp tearing sound startled me as I rested one evening. I, well, I followed it to see the decorative damask wallpaper that my grandmother had installed being destroyed. Bits of it were already on the floor and the wall itself looked as if someone had taken a knife to certain parts of it. Edges were lifted up and I watched as they were pulled away from the wall in various strips and pieces. With each tear of the paper I felt my heart being torn. My grandmother had so meticulously picked that wallpaper out and even asked for my opinion. In the end, she'd chosen one of the ones that I told her I liked. It was as if this unseen force was just ripping at my memories without consideration. I yelled, I screamed, I pleaded for whatever it was to stop, to leave it alone. It paused for a few moments and I felt the air near me shift. I didn't move, not out of fear, but out of shock. I still stared at the ripped wallpaper. The things that came into my home had never destroyed something like this. After a few minutes, it began again. I tried desperately to make it stop. I pushed the strips against the wall. I cried. I begged. Nothing worked. I worked myself into such a frenzy until my energy was spent and I collapsed onto the carpeted floor. Eventually, I fell asleep or passed out from exhaustion. When I awoke, an entire wall's worth of wallpaper was in tatters on the floor. The bare wall that had been previously hidden made my heart hurt, and I forced myself to leave the room, dejected and downtrodden. The wallpaper tearing continued in spurts over the next few days, along with the other normal haunting signs I'd mentioned before. I took to entering the room a few times a day and asking for whatever it was there to just stop. I asked what it wanted, how I could appease it. I was always to no avail. I never received any type of message or sign and it didn't stop until all of the walls were bare. And it only escalated from there. I was lying on my bed one day when I felt everything shake. I sat up, immediately wondering if it was an earthquake. I was about to climb out of bed when I noticed the edge of my blanket moving. On the foot of my bed, my comfortable duvet was being moved away from the corners and bunched up haphazardly toward the center. The shaking had stopped for a moment while this happened, and I knew immediately that it wasn't an earthquake as I'd first suspected. <laughs> Stop! I yelled. Well, it seemed to do the trick. The blanket stopped moving. The bed, however, began to shake again. I pulled my knees up to my chest and backed up against the headboard, pressing myself against it. A loud scraping sound emanated from the end of the bed and it moved a few inches against the wooden floor. I gasped and yelled again for it to stop. Please, stop. This is my bedroom. What do you want? I screamed at the seemingly empty room. The bed moved another inch or two before it ceased. I didn't move, I didn't breathe, I didn't blink. My duvet was then ripped away from me violently. I grabbed for it as it was thrown to the ground. Fabric slipped against my palm, but my fingers found purchase on the edge of the blanket. I tugged it back toward me, getting a better grip on it with both hands. The blanket felt slack for a split second. The end the other thing that had a hold of it yanked hard, pulling my body along with it. I did my best to stay on the bed, but my shoulders and head were left hanging off the side of the bed. 
I clenched my fists around the blanket, refusing to release it. There was one more yank, more gentle than the one before, and I fought back with every ounce of strength I had. I took a moment to gather my thoughts before I righted myself back onto the bed. Before I could sit up, though, I felt a strange sensation on my right shoulder. It was a slight tingle at first, but in a matter of seconds, it felt like my entire shoulder was being grabbed by the devil himself. The pain was sharp and fiery. It burned into my body from one point and spread like shattering glass throughout my entire arm and down my back. I howled in pain and barely felt the bed being shoved over more from where I was. Whatever was in my house, it was strong and didn't care about me. I don't know how long it lasted, the pain and the bed moving. It felt like hours, but I know it couldn't have been that long. At some point, the pain began to fade slowly. I only laid there in agony as it dissipated. When it had subsided enough and I found some strength, I pushed myself up and saw that my bed was now against a wall and my bedside tables, which had flanked each side of the headboard before, were now removed and no longer in the room. My blanket was mostly on the floor and I saw some scratches on the hardwood floor from the bed being moved. I weakly pulled my blanket back onto the bed and curled up into a tight ball with it wrapped and bunched up all around me. Tears stung my eyes, but none came. Well, I wasn't broken yet, but I was feeling myself beginning to crack. I'd never dealt with anything this intense. I know it might not seem like a big deal to you, or most, but in the moment, as these things happened to me, it was absolutely terrifying. I had experience with hauntings. I knew what to expect. It isn't like in the movies or books... It's usually more benign. Most people hardly even notice the presence of spirits because they're so innocuous. And places like my home that become sort of a way station are usually mostly left alone. They come, stay for a while, and then move on. I don't know why it happens this way. Can't even begin to try and figure it out, so I stopped trying a long time ago. All I know is they typically don't stick around. Some have been more persistent, yes, but simple tricks get rid of them. When small things are moved, I put them back. When they fog up the mirrors, I write messages asking them to leave. Even trying to talk with them directly can work. I even have certain protection symbols and items around the house to try and keep the beings moving along. If one's being stubborn, I can move one of my totems into a central place in the house, and once they encounter it, it aids them in moving on. Or if they came across one of the symbols expertly crafted and positioned in important corners of my home, they realise that this place is protected and they let go. This new thing, though, had started with destroying my house and attacking me. This had never happened before. It had actually touched me, and the pain I felt terrified me to my core. Oh, maybe I'm superstitious, but I began to wonder if this was some sort of demon. Things kept happening. My days melted together in a mess of pain, terror and destruction. A wall in the foyer was turned to rubble. The stairs were torn apart and blanks of wood littered the floor. The kitchen was completely annihilated, as if a bomb had gone off amidst its barriers. Along with the damage to the property, I began smelling something happened at least a half dozen times and always started the same with a slight burning smell then a shifting cloud would form as the cloud formed and moved itself through the house stretching and contracting and stretching again the air would increasingly begin to feel heavy and oppressive the scent shifted to something else along with smelling burns there was something else that I couldn't place my finger on it lingered and made me feel sick made my head swim and my body feel weak. When it was abrasive enough, I'd find out later that I'd passed out. I tried everything. I moved totems into various places that would be easily seen. I wrote messages. I yelled. I pleaded. I offered deals. I made sure the symbols were visible. These were all met with harsh retaliation. 
The totems were ruined, the symbols were carved into, breaking the protection seals, and the messages were ignored. All of my pleas and attempts fell on deaf or apathetic ears and eyes. And then there was the altercation, an actual interaction that confirmed there was more than one being haunting my house. I was walking around my home, feeling my heart fall apart in shatters bit by bit as I surveyed the broken pieces of my life. When I entered what used to be the parlour, there was a new symbol on one of the walls. It felt ominous and dangerous. I approached it hesitantly and saw that the lines were impressed into the surface, as if carved with some sort of tool. The closer I got to it, the worse I began to feel. My vision became muddy and I couldn't focus on anything for too long. My chest felt tight and my body heavy. I took a step backward away from it and faltered a bit. I reached out for the couch, and it wasn't where it belonged. I fell to the floor and crawled away from the wall. Ah, there you are. I heard a voice from behind me. I looked over my shoulder and up at what had spoken. It was still difficult to focus, even with the distance between myself and the symbol. All I could see were blurred edges of something clad in or made of black. I felt animosity pouring from it. Who? I tried asking, but felt too weak to finish. You are unwanted in this place, it said. The voice was male, but I couldn't see any details of the creature. This, this is my home. I managed to get out as I struggled to stand, using a table to help steady myself. The thing spoke again, but I couldn't understand the words. He reached out toward me, and I bolted, almost tripping over myself. And it barreled after me, knocking over whatever was in its path. Chairs, tables, the umbrella holder, and more ended up upturned or shoved aside. I stopped suddenly when I entered the kitchen and felt something growing inside of me. It was a churning hurricane of fear and anger. I wasn't sure which I felt the most, but seeing the kitchen again... Forced into this carnage that barely resembled the comforting room it had once been, shifted something inside of me and planted a seed of wrath. I turned on my heels and planned a barrel toward the creature to be the attacker instead of the attacked this time. But just before my hands could make contact, it sidestepped me and yelled out something unintelligible. My body was pulled to the ground as if by some sort of force. I fell to my hands and knees, held in place somehow. The room around me spun and my vision went black, as it had before when I smelled that strange scent that made me sick. When I came to, there were more symbols on the walls, and I found that I couldn't leave the kitchen. I could stand, I could walk around, but I couldn't cross the threshold from the kitchen to the rest of the house. I couldn't explain it. After pacing for a while, I heard distant voices and saw shadowy figures from the adjacent room. They were blurry like the other one had been, and I couldn't understand what they were saying. There were two or three of them, it was difficult to tell, as their forms appeared to shift and meld into one another before separating again and moving around. The voices were strange and sounded too far off for the distance. Please, let me go, I called out weakly. There was no sign of them hearing me or noticing me at all. The other things moved away from my sight, and I was left completely alone. I spent days there, trapped in the kitchen, tortured by the sounds of my house being torn apart. Occasionally one of the beings would appear in the doorway and say something in its demonic language. It would bring with it the dizzying smell, and when I was weak... It touched me and I felt that scalding pain as I had in my bedroom. I didn't know how much longer I'd be able to take it. Every time it happened, I became weaker and weaker. After I don't know how many days, I was finally released from my kitchen prison. I don't know if it was on purpose or accident, but I was able to finally move about my home once again. I am trapped here, but at least I can move around. These things still haunt the walls and rooms of my home. They seem to still be intent on tearing the house apart. I don't know how to get rid of them. 
I fear they might be the end of me. Look, if anyone else has experience with this sort of thing, please help me. I'm at a loss for what else to do, and I worry that I'm running out of time. But, well, on the plus side, I did finally figure out how to possess a living human. So another one of those stories that's been sitting on my laptop desktop for I don't know how long. So finally got around to reading that one. Uh, very weird, mysterious, wonderful. My old friend Bo Whiskey, you long-term listeners to the channel may remember uh, Dead Man Running from a few years ago. So same author. Glad to be reading this one. Oof, okay, well, that is enough for your Monday evening's entertainment. Uh, like I said at the beginning, please check out the Chilling app. Um, a lot of my stories over there now. Um, it is free, but of course the paid version is wonderful and you get lots of extras, but the uh, free version is still pretty good too. So I hope you're going to go and check that out and uh, you'll love it. Till the next time, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.